AI is here, but what is it and how far will it go? This is the Locofoco Netcast. Artificial intelligence has become a hot topic, just as our population's intelligence has never been more in doubt. Okay, that's a joke. Sort of. Anyway, AI is all the rage on everyone's lips. Elon Musk wants to put his brain in a computer or at least attach an interface to an AI-infected uh, internet. Well, Andrew Yang thinks the challenge of AI means we must develop a universal basic income. And why? Because computers and robots are going to do what Ned Ludd thought the old mills, the old dark satanic mills would do, put most of us out of jobs. And that's the mainstream. The UFO and conspiracy-minded people say that AI is already in play, having masterminded the disaster of COVID and is setting up the global totalitarian superstate right now. Next step, digital currency to track and control your every move with a demonic AI to act as sort of a Santa Claus Krampus providing the intelligence. It's all very science fictional, but now it's everywhere. But there are reasons to wonder if this isn't all a wee bit overblown. In Why Machines Will Never Rule the World, philosopher Barry Smith joins polymath Jobst Lagraba to take the proverbial deep dive into the meaning of intelligence and meaning and, well, why have me explain it when we have the authors at hand? And David Ramsey Steele is here to help, considering that I'm way over my head here. So let's start with Dr. Smith. AI is here, but what is it and how far will it go? So AI used to be an attempt to mimic human common sense, human cognitive abilities by using logic. So you would formalize what humans know about salad, for instance, and then use that formalization in a robot so that the robot could go into a salad bar and and create a a meal. That failed completely. Uh, But then people discovered a way in which they could do a lot more than they were able to do in the This this was the 1970s. Stanford was the center of AI. That's when the term was coined. Sometime later, people realized that they could do a lot more by means of what they call deep learning or deep neural networks. And the idea here, and it's a really fantastic idea, is that there is a new kind of mathematics. So in the 1970s, they were using explicit mathematics or explicit formalization, which means you have mathematicians who sit down with pen and or pencil and paper um, and an eraser. Philosophers don't need an eraser. Um, uh, and they would work out the formal content of somebody's mind when they're buying salad. Um, but you can also do implicit mathematics using the, this deep neural network architecture. And what that means is that you, t- you build a a deep neural network infrastructure, and then you collect sample data from the relevant area that you're interested in, for instance, facial recognition or um, chest positions or go positions. And you use that sample data to train the net so that when the net sees another example, which is statistically still close to your sample data, then it will know how to interpret it because your sample data already has the interpretations built in. So, so that, and all of that is actually creating a gigantic algorithm. So it's still mathematics. You have inputs which are numbers, outputs which are numbers, and then the, the algorithm is a product of implicit mathematics. And it can have billions or trillions of parameters. So it can be a really long polynomial. And um, that works really well but only in those areas where you can have sample data which is representative of the entire space. So it works well with chess, it works well with Go, it works well with with, uh, video games of many sorts. It works well with protein folding because protein folding is quite uh, well governed um, for reasons having to do with evolutionary biology. But it doesn't work for getting rich on the stock market or predicting who will divorce or predicting when the next storm will be or what the price of oil will be tomorrow Uh, because there is no representative sample data because we're dealing with complex systems 
which are constantly in process of evolution or change. They never come to an equilibrium. So this is kind of a Geigo problem, a garbage in, garbage out problem, is sort of backwards. Mm. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. There is a garbage. There is a garbage problem aspect to it, but but and I I want to comment on this. It's a good point. But what Barry is describing is more that the fundamental nature of the processes Barry was describing as examples that are hard to model mathematically. That that the fundamental nature means that the processes are irregular. And so, and and animal intelligence or and human intelligence is the ability to deal with irregular processes and dis and survive despite the fundamental irregularity. And you have encountered this yourself in your life. So there were when you learned to drive a car, there were situations you never trained for, but they occurred and you still survived the situation. That and it you have to be very fast. Um, and and so this is this is an example, a very good example of practical intelligence where humans are quite close to animals when they react in this way because they don't have time to think and they react with this instinctive intelligence that is very close to the animal intelligence. And we don't know how this works, but it's it is an ability that that uh, uh, was selected by evolution over over a billion years, and which which is the true intelligence, the ability to cope with with the irregular character, fundamentally irregular character um, of, of our natural environment. And that is what prevents us from building artificial intelligence. Now, now to comment um, quickly on garbage problem. So the garbage problem really is that the sensors that we use um, when we build um, robots or other systems that are supposed to, un to detect what's going on in the natural environment, they lack, they lack active perception. So when we perceive our environment, we use active perception. And this has been, Barry can talk more about this. Um, it has been described already by, by um, um, uh, uh, the inventor of pragmatism. Um, Peirce. Peirce, and, and then also by um, 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 Sheila, and later on by J.J. Gibson, to, in a very detailed way, how this works. But it is a capability that we cannot mimic with computers. And so therefore, the sensors create garbage because they don't do active perception. And so what they create is garbage. We are, we are actually, unfortunately, not writing this in the book. Or indirectly, we are. We are just not saying garbage. But really, it is a type of garbage because it lacks the interactive character of the perception that we are capable of. I've got something to say. Go ahead. Um, I'm thinking of somebody who's watching this, who is new to a lot of this. So I'd like to begin with something very naive. Uh, very clever people like Elon Musk have said that in a few years time, um, the machines are gonna take over. Uh, artificial intelligence is going to rule humankind and then decide what to do with this irritating distraction called humankind. Actually, Elon Musk said, uh, said uh, that it's going to happen in five years, but that was two years ago. So we've only got three years left before the machines take over, according to Elon Musk, who's a very intelligent person. Um, people who are not so intelligent, like Sam Harris, also keep saying this. Um, now, uh, Jobst and Barry uh, disagree with this. They don't think there is any prospect whatsoever, even given a thousand years, that the machines are going to take over. Um, and so I'd like to sort of kick off the discussion from that. Uh, and the, the first observation I have is that uh, in what Barry said, he used the term complex. And it's also something that occurs a lot in the book, in their book, um, uh, complex systems. Now, the the naive response of a typical person who's well enough read to keep up with uh, the New York Review of Books or something like that uh, would be, well, what's the problem? Uh, computers get more complex all the time and they can now do all kinds of things they couldn't do 10 years ago, like beat me at chess. Um, so. Uh, just give it some time and they'll get more and more intelligent. 
and they'll be able to tackle more and more complex things. And com so complexity uh, is a paper tiger. It doesn't really stand in the way. I will just repeat what I said earlier. <laughs> Uh, I'll try and do it differently. So the idea is that there are simple systems in the world, such as your uh, toaster or your cell phone or your camera, which have been designed to, to perform in a very uh, predictable way over and over again by engineers using mathematical equations and so forth. Um, and these, these devices are such that we can predict their behavior. We can predict what will happen under different conditions when, for instance, you press the, the, the button on a camera. Uh, another example of a sy simple system is the, the solar system, which is a, the sun and the planets, let's say, uh, which there's only one force, which is gravity, and we can predict exactly the behavior of the solar system into the far distant future, almost into the infinite future. So the solar system is a simple system. Most of the systems in the, in the world around us and in the universe are not simple. So the weather system is not simple. St New York Stock Exchange simple system is not simple. The uh, earthquake system, the Earth's water system, your digestive system, all the systems in every organism are not predictable. They don't approximate to any kind of equilibrium. They're constantly uh, driven to new kinds of behaviors. Um, and they have all kinds of complex features which make prediction impossible. So your camera doesn't suddenly grow new legs. Um, but there are organisms which suddenly grow new legs. You, you, uh, you grew several children. Um, they, they were elements which you created in your system. With, and it wasn't predictable. Neither when, nor how many, nor with whom um, you would create these new elements in your system. Your system is now a very complicated system. Uh, with new kinds of, uh, of, uh, of interaction. Now there are mother-child interactions, which at one stage there weren't in your system. So your system is not like a camera or a laptop. It's, it's just not predictable. Uh, now Jobst is, uh, is longing to take over. No, I just want to, to add something to this. So I think there are three notions of complexity. So there's complexity in the way that you described it, David, which is the, the common sense understanding of complex, difficult, a lot of different ingredients, if com complicated relationships. That's how every day, that's the everyday usage of complex. Then there's a the mathematical sense, which, which is just uh, the complex number, which is just a special type um, of number that is needed, that Euler invented, that is needed in mathematics, that has to do with uh, unreal numbers and real numbers and uh, and so on. And then there's a third uh, usage of the word complex in this in this um, context of system theory. System theory was invented by um, uh, people thinking about uh, thermod thermodynamics um, in the 40s and 50s, when they started to see systems as thermodynamic systems. And systems outside physics, so a typical thermodynamic system in the sense of statistical mechanics is a bottle of water or a bottle of gas or something like this. But but in the 40s and 50s, people thought, and also Hayek was influenced by this, um, started to think about systems, uh, uh, other systems from, from the perspective of thermodynamics. And then uh, Prigogine um, introduced the notion of complex system, which is a type of thermodynamic system that has properties which make it non-amenable to um, the uh, modeling using physics and mathematics. And um, a, a, a very simple example of this is turbulence, which, for example, occurs when um, waves are formed or when the wind blows through dry sand. So when the wind blows through dry sand, a piece of, I mean, small elements of the sand are blown away and they, they swirl through the air or cigarette smoke, or many other phenomena, and, or water that is poured um, into a glass from a bottle. And the behavior of this turbulence is such that we cannot mathematically model it. Uh, it, it, it is, for cer certain reasons, impossible to create equations that, that let us model this behavior. And that, that has, and, and these, the, all these properties, Barry has listed some of them, they, 
make sure that mathematical models cannot describe or predict what's going on. And two, which Barry hasn't um, hasn't mentioned, is um, the non-ergodic phase space of such systems and also their context de dependence. So um, um, the solar system as a simple system is, a, is, for example, is a gravitational system. And it's, it's, um, it's not a logic system. And it's not um, by chance that it was the first system that was mathematically fully described by Galileo and then Newton. That's because it's a simple system with, with only one interaction type. And if you take the sun and its planets and move them a tenth of a parsec closer to Alpha Centauri, so that would be 0.35 light years closer, nobody would notice it. So the, the system is to a large extent, extent content, context independent. Of course, if you move it very close to Alpha Centauri, the sun will interact with the two stars of Alpha Centauri, then there will be chaos. But but to a large extent, it's, it's context independent. And complex systems are totally context dependent. So they are embedded in their context. And if you remove them from their context, they fail. So if you put a human being under the water, after six minutes, the human being is dead. Right. So it, and and um, and the same is true for all complex systems. They are context dependent and they have also this non ergodic property, which means that because they create novelty all the time, when you observe them for a while, you, you cannot predict them afterwards because they may change their behavior totally. And so this is a type of complexity that has nothing to do with complex in the common sense way which you used it. And that's what prevents the mathematical model. And if you let me just add one more paragraph. Uh, so computers can only compute what is computable. And we have a very good mathematical understanding of the, ph the, the phenomenon of computability. Uh, Turing uh, invented uh, or discovered uh, what it is that makes a certain mathematical algorithm computable or not. And we can compute a lot of things inside a computer, but we can't compute uh, predictions of the behaviors of complex systems beyond a certain very limited generic set. We can't create synoptic predictions about the behaviors of complex systems. So we can predict, David, that you will fall asleep and then wake up again, and then fall asleep again. Uh, but we can't predict what you will be thinking about in three minutes and what, what kind of smile will be on your face in two minutes. Um, we can't predict uh, any of the, those interesting things. And that's a fact which will hold of computers in a million years, that they can't, can only compute what is computable. And the mathematical limits on computability are very severe. Actually, mathematical mod modeling is much broader than computability. So first you have a restriction what you can model mathematically. And then the set of what you can compute is even smaller than the set of what yeah. you can model mathematically. And even if you have quantum oh. computers, it will still be subject to the Turing computability criteria. So um, Jobst uh, used a word which I n now know about because I've glanced through the book a couple of times, uh, but which before that I'd never heard of, non-ergodic or non-ergodic. Um, and this is directly related to the technical use of the term complex. So let me tell you what my guess, because I'm a Popperian, so everything's a guess. Uh, my guess as to uh, what this means, it means there are some systems that can be modeled with uh, workable perfect accuracy by mathematical um, means. There are other systems, and this, these are what you call non-ergodic or complex systems. They cannot be modeled precisely. And if you attempt to model them in a rough and ready way, you lose in essential information. So have I got that right? Yes. OK, yes, you know, uh, <clears throat> I've been interested in this from a different angle altogether. Um, uh, I came to the conclusion um, some years ago, and I wrote something about this in 2018, that um, a lot of popular culture, uh, for instance, um, Westworld, the TV, uh, the TV show, not so much the uh, earlier movie, um, but um, 
the earlier movie was open to the interpretation that these computer that these robots couldn't really think, uh, and that's why um, uh, it was the a perfect um, match for Yul Brynner's uh, acting technique uh, to be able to portray a character that couldn't really think. Um, but the the TV <laughs> show um, that uh, that gave you the impression that these robots had learned to really think and feel and have intentions and have emotions and so on and so forth. Another example was Battlestar Galactica. I don't mean the old one back in the 1950s, but the new one that was uh, just a few years ago. One of the things about Battlestar Galactica, the new one, is that there were certain people who viewed the... Um, the, what, what are they called? Cylons? The Cylons. Yeah, they viewed the Cylons as mere machines and they referred to them in a deprecating manner as toasters. In, in other words, they're just like machines for toasting bread, slices of bread. And the general implication of the show was that these are bigoted racists who mm. uh, persist, in, persist in treating um, uh, machine humans or machine simulacra of humans as subhuman because they don't really have an interior life. They're just toasters. Um, and it, I, I thought at the time when I was watching this, well, you know, how do we know that they do have an interior life? It's true that if they're tortured, uh, they scream, uh, but then they've been programmed to do that because they've been programmed to, uh, to behave just like humans. Um, so that doesn't really prove that they're actually suffering. So it seems to me that, um, that what uh, Yobbs and Barry are doing, they're, they're rehabilitating those bigoted racists uh, who thought that the Cylons were just toasters. No, so we, we, actually, we don't believe that there could be Cylons. You can't, there have been 50 years now of attempts to create chatbots, which give the appearance of being intelligent when conversing with humans. They still haven't created chatbots, which are not annoying. And if you don't believe me, then call your bank. But David, I, I have another um, aspect of this, this um, in a way sociological or political aspect. So I think that you have to see the whole hype of artificial intelligence in the context of transhumanism. And tra transhumanism is, is an ideology, um, a very dangerous ideology um, because it is, it is um, directed against, uh, it pretends to be based on science but it's totally unscientific oh. and, and directed against the very fundaments of science. But it's dangerous because uh, it can lead to, you know, um, activities on humans that, that harm humans and that are unnecessary and so on. And so, so th this, this kind of um, propaganda that you mentioned for Battleship Galactica, that, that ties well, that shows you how... Um, the transhumanist ideology is also tied to certain political ideologies. Now, our book is, of course, totally apolitical, but I still want to, and I don't want it to be the other way, but I still want to make the point that, that we are arguing from this perspective, very, very solid perspective of mathematics and physics to reject ideas that are unscientific. And the idea of AGI is fundamentally as unscientific as the idea um, of transhumanism so that you can create digital immortality or improve the intelligence of humans with genetical engineering. And, and um, the reason for this, uh, I, can, I can go on a little bit more, but I just wanted to tie this into the aspect of transhumanism. Jobst, you said AGI. That might need to be explained. So that's, that's a movement that calls itself artificial general intelligence. The term was invented maybe 20 or 30 years ago to delineate the proponents of this movement against those who are merely doing normal, narrow AI. So I have done a lot of narrow AI pro professionally as a scientist, but also as an entrepreneur by programming machines to do narrow tasks better than humans, like playing chess or so. There are tasks. And those tasks, by the way, that Barry mentioned in his very first comment, they are closed world tasks. So there are tasks where everything about the world in which the machine acts is known and can also be represented adequately, usually using a Cartesian coordinate system. It is often a coordinate system with more than two or three coordinates. It can have hundreds of coordinates, 
but it is still a coordinate system like a Cartesian one. And then in such a situation, you can have narrow AI and the AGI proponent said, no, no, narrow AI is not enough. We will be able to create real AI, we call it general intelligence. There will be no intelligent chatbots. Um, that's a prediction. And I, so there will be, we hope anyway, computers inside banks which respond more friendlily uh, and more naturally than the ones we have at the moment. But um, it, it's been 50 years and they still haven't cracked that problem. And um, the, I think that the, it's only in my car the same problem arises with the navigation system when I try to talk to it. Are, it's, course, it's a new German car. <laughs> there are, of course, good reasons why this is impossible. The, the reason is that that language, if you look at, I think it's a good topic if, if you don't mind, but you can interrupt me. So, so there's now a language model called GPT-3, which is very famous, which is discussed a lot by the press and which creates a lot of hype. And they say, oh, this is now intelligent. Google, somebody at Google said it has become conscious and so on. But but um, basically, it is um, based. It is one of those neural networks which were parameterized with billions of parameters. By the way, the idea, the mathematical idea, is from Gauss. It's two hundred year, two hundred and twenty years old, right? It's not the idea of the regression idea is is two hundred twenty years old. There were some refinements one hundred twenty years ago, and another set of refinements in the seventies. But the, the, the mathematically, it's not so new. It's just that now we have the computing power. That just a side remark. But but um, so so um, the the reason and so GPT three is trained on huge amounts of text in the internet, and what it can do it is it can given a certain sequence of symbols which it doesn't understand it can create another sequence of symbols which match with the sequence of symbols that it has obtained as input that can look at the first glance kind of interesting, but if you if you use it a bit and then try to engage in a real conversation. Um, where, for example, you're referring to something outside the conversation or you are, you know, doing many things that humans do all the time when they do conversations, like going back to a certain topic, you immediately notice that the machine has no context, no semantics, no pragmatics, that it's just lost. And so that's because, because all this training material that is available, this huge collector of text in the Internet, are, are the output of a non-ergodic system. And so, and so I think the best example... Um, is is if you go to a baker and you queue in the line and is a chatty baker of and he and lady behind the counter is chatting to each customer. All these conversations are trivial, most of them, but they are still very individual and totally unpredictable. Uh, let me give you another example, which I only discovered today, and this may make me famous, or, or Google may fix it. So I, I like playing with Google Translate and um, finding ways in which it makes errors in its translation. It gets harder and harder, but I found now a whole new kind of error which is easy to generate. So you take any paragraph of English which has a vaguely technical term, uh, maybe consonant or series of vowels, or uh, not, not very technical, and then you, uh, you hit the, uh, the enter key, so uh, you put that into Google, it will give you a good translation in almost all cases. But if you hit the enter key before the technical term, or maybe just at random anywhere in the sentence, Google will produce something which contains a piece of nonsense. So the, the, sent the, the, the paragraph still looks, or the sentence still looks perfectly coherent to an, a human eye, because we don't see that there's a, 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 line, a line, what's the word, break in the middle. But Google can't cope with the fact there's a line break in the middle of a sentence. And so uh, and I tried it I, not hundreds of times, but dozens of times. And about nine out of, in about nine out of 10 cases, Google produced nonsense. It was still using the words there, but they did, they were, it added words or it, it, it uh, twisted them around. It tried to make the sentence simple and it failed. Um, now that's because Google has no semantics. The Google Translate doesn't, it's not based on semantics. It's based on patterns. And a line break is a very salient pattern that Google takes seriously, where when we are, visu when we are having visual information about a sentence, we, we don't care about line breaks. We can cope with them quite easily. So try it as an experiment. This could make this, this podcast famous if you can set it up. <laughs> anyway. Oh, but Google will fix that, of course, in due course. They will. 
So it's Although, a hidden line break. As you're saying, yeah, you, put, you basically yeah, yeah. hid the line break and it confused yeah. the computer. So Douglas Hofstetter, I don't know, 12 years ago, pointed out that Google tra Translate can be tricked by sentences which have a lot of back anaphora. Uh, and so the case he uses was something like, in in their house, everything comes possessive in pairs. Possessive pronouns. Yeah, possessive pronouns. In their house, everything comes in pa pairs. There are his sheets and her sheets, his forks and her forks, and so on, like that. And Google Translate didn't get the possessive pronouns. And so it said, in their house, everything comes in pairs. There are his sheets and his sheets and his pair, his forks and her and his forks, and so on. So, and that was 12 years ago. I tried it again, the very same sentence. And now, and Google should know that Hofstetter has been using this sentence in Scientific American and places like that. It's worse. So the translation you get from the Hofstetter sentence is actually worse than the translation that you were getting for 10 years or so. I can explain you why. That's a very important property that many others saw. So there's a guy whom we also cite in our book, um, 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 what's his name? Not Martin. I, I always forget him. You will remember him, Barry, who has written several books about the inadequacy of stochastic models without seeing the complex system problem. And he points out, for example, that they acted willfully. So if you if you see that a neural network produces a mistake pattern, it's almost impossible to correct this, right? So only in a closed world setting you can correct it, but in open world settings you can't. And open world settings are exactly the settings dealing with complex systems and and the complexity because the model. The, the, the interesting thing is that the model itself, no matter how many parameters it has, is of course still what a model made of Newtonian mathematics. So it's a logic system, but the real world is a complex system. So there is a discrepancy, structural discrepancy between the system that is logic and mathematical and even of relatively limited mathematics because it's, it must be able to run a computer. On the one hand, on the other hand, the complex system that creates this inability to correct the system it's, it in a causal fashion and so on. So there are many, many problems um, What's the name of the guy? I'll look him up while when Barry speaks or when you one of you speaks. Um, and he pointed this out and it's very clear. And so what Barry says, that gives an example. Isn't there something more fundamental here? And, and that is that um, when a computer makes an utterance in a natural language, uh, the computer has no understanding of what it's talking about. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's fairly fairly obvious. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, and when it when it sees an image of a lion and says this is a lion, it has no understanding of what it's talking about. It doesn't know anything right, about lions right. or animals or anything. Right. And that's course, why it um, can sometimes describe a lion as the back end of a bus if you give it the right background, because the computer right, looks right. at the background. And, and and you do run into people who will say, "Oh, what's understanding? That that's not that's not not a real thing." Uh, and I take I assume that this is the fact that you meet people who talk like that, and I suppose Daniel Dennett sometimes talks like that. Yeah, um, uh, is because although we have we meaning in, uh, sort of intellectuals in the Western world, we have rejected behaviorism. We're still haunted by the ghost of behaviorism. The idea that if you start talking about um, inner states, phenomenological states of mind and so on, uh, oh, this is something in poor taste there. We ought to be able to get rid of that. Yeah, so we spend quite a lot of time in the, the most philosophical chapter, which is about the mind-body problem, addressing this issue. So we, we think that everything is governed by physical laws. We think that everything in the universe is, in that sense, physical, but we know phenomenologically that there are conscious experiences, that there are acts of will, that there are understandings, thinkings, decidings, and so forth. And so we put those two uh, uh, beliefs of which we are confident, equally confident, together by arguing that all of these fantastic phenomenological capabilities that human organisms have are uh, capabilities which are rooted in ac actions uh, at, at a very, very fine-grained level in the brain. So fine-grained 
that we will almost certainly never understand how they work. And therefore also, we, we, we would never be able to uh, emulate how they work in a computer for yet another reason, namely that we can't understand them in the first place. And now in that there is this book by Nick Bostrom called uh, Superintelligence, which describes how uh, the, the computers can be made more and more intelligent and then they will take over the universe. And um, so one interesting passage in that book uh, is the one where he says that because we will have much more intelligent computers in the future, all philosophers should immediately give up their present work and join him in his attempt to prevent uh, the, the singularity, because what the philosophers are doing will be done much better by machines. So they're wasting their time as they continue doing it. Pure mathematicians are supposed to stop working too. What Bostrom says is that we can understand how human brains can can have semantics, can have understanding of meaning, can have intelligence, can have thoughts and wills and so on by examining the very, very fine structure of our brains. And the problem is that to do that, you would have to kill the brain. So you have to kill the organism, which is, is the brain off, because you can't you can't image the brain. Uh, with, with uh, when it's alive, because you need to get it through the skull, as it were. But even if you could kill the the patient and and yet still see the structure of the neurons and so forth, because it's the dynamics of the brain which is so important, you would lose the dynamics because the neurons would be in a dead brain. But worse than that, the kind of um, image resolution that you would need to get down to the levels we're talking about now is several orders of magnitude finer grains than the imaging devices that we are ever likely to be able to obtain given the limits on uh, the photonic limits on the imaging devices and other limits on our mechanical possibility. Even if we could uh, create such devices which are probably impossible to generate um, given the limitations of physics, and measure all of this, we couldn't make sense of it. And that's because the system is so big. And you have to take into account that the systems we can make sense of, they, they contain usually not more than three or four variables, right? The Fourier equation, um, uh, Schrödinger equation, and other famous differential equations that we use in physics, they contain very few variables. Physics is Physics equations are five, six variables. Sometimes there are more symbols, but the others are constants, right? So, so the variables are very few, and that's be because the the models that can be used um, uh, in our um, uh, with our mathematics, the mathematics we have, they are very limited. And um, so, so that's that's um, why. How many neurons are there in the brain? A hundred billion, and so yeah. each of them contains. Uh, hundreds of thousands of different molecules and who interact in three dimensions packed in a very tight way i mean it's i think it's it's, it's totally hopeless and th that there there is a whole field called biophysics which in which i was also for a short while which tries to use um, differential equations to model biological phenomena and of course some phenomena can be modeled like uh, sleep wake cycles and some other phenomena can be modeled to a certain extent but there's no holistic model I want to go back once more to understanding and meaning. So what is understanding? What is meaning? I think it is rooted um, in, in the, the question that's also, also what phenomenologists say. What does this mean for me, for my life, for my intentions, for my next actions, what I'm experiencing? What, what, what is the importance of it? And, and our, our main ability that Husserl describes so well is that we can all ignore a huge set of things around us um, because they mean nothing to us at the moment for our intentions, but that our focus of intentionality can rapidly change and then something becomes meaningful. That This is a motive in everybody's life every day. It's also a motive that is very often used in movies or in, in novels. And and um, I think that's, that's um, biological understanding. You have this even in very primitive... Um, uh, pri uh, um, primitive uh, animals or bacteria, Aristotle called the drivenness, entelechia, the inner goal to have an inner goal, and it it is it is it manifests as drivenness um, as the type of energy usage en energy usage that is unique to living systems, and um, I 
it is it is that what creates meaning for us. So basically, if your hungry food can have as an affordance the same meaning, uh, a similar type of meaning for you, then then a salt gradient has for a halophile bacterium. And and so this is this is what meaning is. And machines don't have these intentions, so they cannot have a sense of meaning. And that's one of the reasons why they're so bad when it comes to serving as chatbots. So the reason why we can have such interesting conversations is because we all have goals and those goals keep the conversations going. So we all want to impress each other and we all want to display our, in this conversation, here, display our deep wisdom. And, um, and, and, and we also want to undermine each other's goals so that their wisdom seems to be somehow lesser. And then if we're in a, a, a shop buying bacon, then we have other goals to make sure that everyone thinks that we're friendly, but we want to get the bacon also. And that's why humans can pass the Turing test and machines can't, because machines don't have a will. So you're saying there's no real grammar sense in, in all the uh, AI language stuff we do. They don't really have a sense of grammar? Oh, it, it, that's a good point. I would say they have a sense of syntax. Okay. But they don't have a sense of semantics. So the classical model of linguistics says there's morphology of language at the bottom, then comes syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and pragmatics is the highest level. That's the ability to understand sentences in context and so on. And machines have some sense. You can um, emulate a sense of morphology and also sense of syntax. So the, there are syntax parsers available, which can now um, uh, uh, attribute uh, out of, you know, 100... 20 brown corpus tags that are syntactic tags for word types they can they can automatically determine the correct tags for 95 or 90 percent of the words of of a even of a complicated text I, you should maybe not use finnegan's wake but but you can certainly use um john steinbeck <laughs> and and it will it will be very very good so so at the syntactic level there is the machine doesn't understand the syntax but it at least can there's a quite good emulation of uh, of syntactical understanding and and that's that's also um and the all the problems of the translation or or gpt like sequence algorithms arise when you go beyond the syntactic understanding and and that that's the case for all problems that are interesting for us because the syntax for us is just a lower layer that we need to that is used by humans to understand, but that it's of course there are many many other aspects of language beyond syntax that we use. Again, if it were not the case, we couldn't read Finnegan's Wake, which is often but agrammatical. GPT three can still answer questions in ways which give the impression that it has a very very clever uh, semantics and a very a large body of knowledge because GPT was programmed by taking huge dollops of the internet. Uh, and, and just making it, I don't know, coherent, could one say? Uh, the problem is that you, you, it will answer six questions in very impressively, and then the seventh question, it will say something absurd that no human would ever say, because that particular area just was not um, sufficiently present in its uh, database, in, in the sample training data that we use. And so that, that makes the six questions that it gets correct really impressive, but then the seventh question shows you that it's really just a parlor trick. It's like the, the dog that can do arithmetic. Um, it's not really doing arithmetic. It's following the twitches of its master's eye. So we've sorted this out then. And um, it, these people who say that uh, we're going to be ruled by the machines in three years' time are uh, making some kind of mistake. Yes. Yeah. So I think that Elon Musk is a very, very clever person. Um, but he lacks the training in physics and mathematics to understand what's going on inside an AI emulation. So I think that that is it. It is very demanding. So most of the students who have a master in AI, you can now get since in Germany at the University of Bielefeld, the master of AI could already be obtained thirty-five years ago. Also in other universities in the United States, and 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 even so, there have been many many generations of students and professors who have. AI professorships, AI degrees, and most of them, they lack the. They are most of most of them are computer scientists or like or engineers. Most of them don't understand um, function analysis. 
And functional analysis is a part of mathematics that was invented in the late 19th century, early 20th century, which enabled the general theory of relativity. So without it, there would not be the general theory of relativity. And it is, if you don't understand functional analysis, you cannot understand how AI works. And so basically they are applying parts of mathematics without understanding them. And that's why they're also giving such stupid opinion. I mean, as a mathematician, I can say, well, that's what I often unfortunately hear in many areas from engineers. So they are good when they are building stuff that they know how to build. They are brilliant. I admire them completely. Also for the you know diligence and patience you need to build a bridge correctly or a submarine. But when it comes to predicting things for which you need mathematical knowledge, then it's often you just it's just a lack of training. Take a step back a little bit. Have you played with Dolly, the the artificial intelligence that draws for you, that makes pictures? I've read some papers about what it does. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting question to describe exactly what the achievement is here. But we have a general line uh, in regard to such questions, which is to say that all of the interesting work is being performed by the human beings who built the uh, the, the system. And uh, you, uh, very often using uh, contributions from uh, science going back hundreds of years, which have been, uh, they've, they've managed to find a way of putting them together. And, and the existence of deep neural network technology, remember, makes possible very, very sophisticated kinds of mathematical equations to be created without you knowing any mathematics. You just know how to train a neural net. Um, and so they're, they're, they're do, the, the DALI is doing something fantastic, but 99% of the achievement is to be ascribed to the humans who built it. It's, I think it's a, a generative artificial neural network. So, uh, uh, and it works, sorry, an adversarial neural network. So there are two neural networks. One of them, so in this case, the first one has to understand the natural language and draw a picture, and the second one has to decide whether the picture is acceptable. And, and it does this, of course, they are first separately trained, and then they are trained together. And by this, you can you can uh, uh, achieve very impressive automated drawings, which look very good. Um, but but in the end, um, the, it is it is it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's, it's a very, very elegant um, uh, language recognition and and also um drawing algorithms but there is nothing intelligent about it. it it's quite well understood its components are well understood it's, it's it's a beautiful piece of engineering that's what i mean yeah if those engineers don't don't really know the mathematics of what they're doing that doesn't matter because they do great using these components they achieve great things so i don't want to diminish any of the engineering achievements that the ai community has produced in the last 20 years that's very clear but it has nothing to do with intelligence I think we should also mention that it seems that DALI creates good graphic uh, patterns, uh, not automatically, but the users of DALI who want to get good images for this or that phrase, or they have to work quite hard to find the exact kind of uh, trick, linguistic trick, which will generate trigger. The trigger, trigger, which will generate the images that they think look really good. And so right. we still have a human uh, input also on the back end. Well, that's um, the human... interesting thing is is artists are, or people are just using Dali to and interacting with it and going over many iterations sometimes to get what they want. So it's yeah. a learning procedure, I guess, both ways. Would you say both ways or would you say only one way? Only one way. Oh, so, my. So... That's that's the controversy, isn't it? I, I mean, the machine cannot learn anything. There is no machine learning. Machine learning is a misnomer, right? What what happens when you when a machine quote unquote learns is that it establishes from the perspective of functional analysis all it does is it uh, that it computes a function that links an input to an output. The function that Dal E computes is very complicated. It's very long. It has very very many parameters, but it it is nothing that is learned. It's just a function that that takes an input and so it's like a very long equation where you can put in a lot of variables and it, and then it computes a result. That's that's all it does. And one should never forget this. So there is no machine learning. There is only um, uh, statistical learning. That's the right term. The name the term that Trevor Hasty, one of the great. Uh, uh, Bradley Efron and Trevor Hasty are the, the, the most important statisticians who revived 
um, uh, regression analysis in the 70s and 80s. And I, I was, I had actually, I, I, they, they are very, very good. And they talk about, about statistical learning and and reject the notion of, of machine learning because the machine doesn't learn anything, right? It's just, it's, it's just an, an algorithm that is used to create this functional. And this functional is, of course, useless in any other context than this very narrow context to which it has been trained. And, and this, and and um, on, in addition, so the only one who learns something is a human who learns how to use the software. There is this uh, program called AlphaGo, which is the DeepMind uh, program that can beat Go masters playing Go. And uh, they, they they created, and that, that is truly uh, a, a great achievement of, of mankind, again. So a, a greater than the Cologne Cathedral. It embodies hundreds of years of, of mathematics and crystallography and a dozen other disciplines in a very beautiful architecture, which can then predict folding, protein folding. Uh, sorry, I get, I'm, I'm getting confused here. Uh, we're talking about AlphaGo. Now, it only works for Go. The rules of Go are quite explicit, are quite complicated, and they are imported into the machine in a certain way. Now, they, the, the complaint was it's not really intelligent because it can only play Go. And so the DeepMind people invented something called, uh, is it AlphaGo Free? What's the name of this? Uh, AlphaGo Free is a, a, a machine that can learn to play other games. Is that correct? I don't know how it's, I don't remember its name, but the it's thing is, different games. So the, the, the idea was, I, I, yes, I, Alpha, the new version of AlphaGo did not need to see any games of Go. They didn't need to see human beings playing Go. They didn't need to see other computers playing Go. They, 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 and they claim that this proves that the computer can think. It can work out what the moves should be all by itself. But what they don't mention is that in this AlphaGo free version, they're still giving it the rules of Go. And that's, I don't know, it depends how you print it, but it's dozens of pages of very, very technical statements about how you do scoring and so forth and so it's again an achievement of human beings even when they work out how to play go all by themselves they're still starting out from the rules uh, uh, which are provided to them by humans i mean it basically what it is is what ada loveless who was not the first programmer that's actually ideology but she was she was a, a kind of philosopher of computation quite early one and she said that that the the computer which her husband designed, which was a mechanical um, calculation machine, but basically a Turing machine, um, uh, um, that that this machine can cannot do anything by itself, but can only do what it has been told to do, and this is very true even of today's AI. So so what 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 you do to to um, uh, to achieve this, the software that Barry just describes is that you let then two machines to which you have um, programmed the rules of Go and how to score points, that you let them play against each other, and uh, and then they 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 can so to speak because it's a reward based system because when you score a point you get a reward, uh, which corresponds to an optimization algorithm and then you can optimize the way they play. It's very elegant mathematically how it's set up. Um, it's very clever, but it is just a way of instructing the machine in a very efficient way by using a lot of computational power. AI itself, all the machines, all the algorithms are fantastic achievements of human beings. What about achievements in the realm of uh, machine-created art, works of art? There are things like fugues by Johann Sebastian Bach, which um, people describe as highly mathematical, meaning they're very strictly rule-governed, although when you study them closely, there are many inspired touches uh, and, and certainly a very dog-eared application of a few rules of thumb is not going to give you a Bach fugue. Um, uh, what's the potential for um, machines, machine intelligence, so to speak, uh, to create great visual art or great musical art. I think narrative art might be a bit beyond them, but um, uh, is there a future in this? There's a good definition of art. I mean, Barry, you can also, you know um, uh, more about uh, um, uh, Ingarden than I do, but, but a very good definition of art says that art has three components. So, and that applies to all types of art, originality, 
um, formal perfection and authenticity, but not in the woke version, but in the real version. <laughs> now, a machine can certainly achieve formal perfection. And we already see drawings made by machines, which, which are highly, in a formal way, highly perfect. But of course, because machines don't have personality, they cannot achieve authenticity. And they can also not achieve originality because both are the output of a person. And we also, do we talk about the person in the book a bit when we talk about the will, but I think we kind of dodged the topic of a person in the book, but but without a person, you certainly cannot achieve um, authenticity and, um, uh, and originality. And if you look at the secondary masters of, of music um, and and art, um, and then you listen to them. They very often have highest uh, um, perfection with regard to um, uh, functionality and, and achievement of the for formal aspects of art. Like Czerny, Czerny was a contemporary of of Beethoven. He was fantastic in in the for in the in the technical perfection, but he totally lacked originality and authenticity. His work is dead. It sounds like like eating dust when you listen to this. And and he he's famous because when you when you learn the piano, you have to do the Chinese etuden. I don't know how it's called in English. Studies. They're very very studies. complicated. Yeah, the Chinese studies they're very complicated and hard to learn. Mm -hmm. And many generations of students have been tortured with them, but and you need to do them to become good at the piano. But it's it's empty, yeah? and that's that's the yeah. art what the machines can create. So I don't believe in machine art at all. So I would I have a slightly different view on this. So when Go AlphaGo started to win games against people, the, the Japanese Go mas masters are they Japanese or Chinese? Japanese. Um, Japanese Go masters said, said they were they were really impressed. They said that the the, the AlphaGo had taught them new strategies of, of high brilliance. Uh, so I think that, that there are ways in which um, there could be contributions in the uh, aesthetic uh, plane, which are in some sense higher than what humans could achieve. But again, I would emphasize that 99% of the work here is being done by humans, because the reason why the Japanese Go masters can recognize uh, super elegant uh, strategies is because they've been playing Go for 50 years and they um, they know what's what. And if you take those humans out of the equation, there's no one left to pick out the really elegant Go strategies or the really fantastic fugue variations. So that's uh, the a very important argument John Searle is making uh, in his in his views on artificial intelligence that um, because that that the machine output uh, without a human observer is com completely makes no sense, right? If your cat looks at the printout of your computation from astrophysics or the cat, it will only smell where it can eat it because the printout will smell of ozone. It will not eat it, period. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's the point that Sal makes it. Th these, these, these artifacts that, that we program computers to do are of course meaningless without us. And um, and if they and they are of course also meaningless to the machine. The machine is just they are just electrons uh, moved or nowadays. Uh, later on, that will be with quantum computers a bit different. But basically, there are only logical operations being performed, um, uh, which are in essence mechanical. Okay, I'm going to give a general impression, and this is going to be slightly odd, so bear with me. Um, there are people I know who believe in God very much. And they ascribe every good thing a human does to God because God created us and God made the program. <laughs> so you see where I'm going with this. You seem to be making us God, human beings God, the engineers God, and the AI is just what my Christian or theistic friends say we are. We're just the masks of God or something. So the, any general reaction to that? <laughs> you go first. Yes. yes, I have a strong reaction. So so the, the, the why the analogy doesn't work is that God is a transcendent entity. So and and uh, humans are not transcendent, though they have a, some have a need for transcendence. Humans are not transcendent, but they are uh, real 
existing entities, physical entities, and so are computers. And humans, as, as Vico pointed out, he was one of the first philosophers to see this in the 17th century. Uh, we don't cite him because Barry said it's too complicated to cite him, and I agree because you need to explain too much. But he, he was said that, that humans can only really understand well what they do themselves. So human creation is a logic system. And, and being able to create logic systems is basically what distinguishes, is one of the huge disting, uh, uh, distinguishing features that makes a difference between animals and humans. Animals can solve complicated uh, problems, also logical problems to a certain extent, um, uh, but, but they cannot create logic systems themselves. And, um, and, and, and so the ability to create a logic system, to run it and to give it properties that are desired it's just, just technology, right? And you cannot compare the act of create a transcendent act of God's creation in a in a belief system to the physical creation of logic system. So I would just add that that humans can also create uh, collaborative plans and execute them. So they can create things like wars, uh, armies, um, hospitals, um, uh, chess world championship uh, tournays and so forth. Uh, and some of those are not logic systems, particularly the first one. Set first, and the hospitals are not logic systems either because they have organisms going through them at different size levels. So, so most of human creations are not, most uh, what humans create are social systems and they are of course yeah. to totally complex. But, but I was just pointing out um, uh, you, I was just referring to the machines we build. Right. Now, another way of looking at this is evolutionary, right? Uh, it's only been 100 years or so that we've been working on these problems of artificial intelligence. You talk about mathematics. Evolution that produced us, that would be sort of how I usually look at this, uh, has been going on for millions and millions of years. So maybe we're just jumping the gun here. And we talk about this in the book. So this, the simple story uh, in the book that there is a more complicated story, which we may get to, is that uh, some people like David Chalmers believe that we will crack the uh, problem of creating an AGI by uh, using the, the um, root of artificial life. So we'll create very simple artificial life in the computer, and then we will run evolution very, very rapidly in the computer and get more and more complex artificial life. And now evolution created intelligence. So if we emulate evolution inside the computer, eventually we'll create intelligence. So this is the, the, the strategy he uh, advocates for defending the view that, that computers will one day achieve AGI. And um, the problem with this is that evolution is way more complicated than intelligence. So in order to emulate intelligence, we would need to know how evolution works. And we have no idea how evolution works. And most of the data that we would need uh, is gone <laughs> um, a long time ago. So there's no way in which we could emulate uh, in evolution in, inside computers. And the, the whole discipline of artificial life is in fact very disappointing. There's, there's very little that, that it has produced. Um, now I think there's a more complicated story about evolution um, so uh, we assume that the human race is going to continue, or let's assume that the, the totality of organisms on this planet is going to continue to evolve. Humans will evolve in some way, and they, the, the computers will get uh, better and better in certain ways. Now, we know from what we've learned in the last hour that there are mathematical limits to how good they can become, but they will become very good along more of these narrow lanes like Go and protein folding and chess and video games. There are many others which are uh, being used in industry at the moment where AI is being applied along certain narrow lanes where we control the systems involved because they're logic systems. There'll be much more of that. Uh, the, the world will, because of AI, become a richer and a more comfortable, uh, friendly place, we believe. AI is is a part of, of course, the industrial revolution, and it's it's a, it's a it's a type of applied mathematics, like all the engineering sciences. It creates more, it can create more wealth, it can create advantages, but also like other engineering disciplines, 
I mean, you can use TNT to mine uh, a gold mine uh, by removing rocks, but you can also put it into a bomb. Yeah, and so that's the same with all nuclear fission. You can use it to for power plants and also for atomic bombs. So, so like every technology, AI is a technology with high potential for harm and for good. And so, in the end, and that's maybe to 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 quickly touch on the field of ethics of AI. So there are no ethics of AI in the sense that that um, AI will develop per, a person and then it will becomes an ethical subject. But of course, like with any technology, like a hammer or whatever, you need to understand um, uh, uh, the ethics of using it properly. So that's the problem, like with all technology. But there is no AI ethics in the sense that uh, um, uh, there is a conscious individual that that can be that that can be the subject of an ethical consideration. So the upshot really is what your title says. Why machines will never rule the earth. It they can't, it's too complicated. The ufologists who say it's happening right now are wrong. Uh, you're you're making a bet on that. You're saying yeah, actually we, we have a little footnote about Fermi's Sperm, paradox. Okay. Uh, so the, the paradox is that uh, there are all these planets where intelligent beings might surely have evolved, and some of them are going to have super intelligence. Um, because they have AI and the AI has reached AGI and then they've got more and more intelligence. And so they ought to be uh, exploring the world at regular intervals. And yet we never see them. Now we have a solution to that paradox. There is no AGI. There can never be an AGI. There can, there, not even on distant planets can there be an AGI. They're all restricted in the same way that we're restricted. Now that is not a very good argument because there might be other ways in which they can create super duper technology without having to have uh, machine super intelligence but still it's a it's a consideration which should be added to the list of other considerations I, I really think that the whole idea of being able to create artificial intelligence results from from a lack of understanding of mathematics and physics and if you read it's it's the same in in, in theory and and philosophy of physics if you read, what the best physicists say themselves about their science is very, very different from what some naive philosopher says who has never understood a textbook of quantum mechanics. There's a real problem here that people talk about things that they don't understand. And when I started to, you know, the reason I wanted to write the book was that my customers asked me, why aren't you building chatbots? And I was getting tired of it. And then I, I started to write about it. And then I called Barry because I th said, I need a philosopher to collaborate with me so that we can combine my knowledge of mathematics and physics with, with what Barry knows on philosophy to create a really convincing book. And I think that this is not done enough that very, very many people who think about such problems, they lack the education and the knowledge um, <clears throat> to, to, make, to, to see it properly. So I think it's really just a big misunderstanding I don't know any physicist, any theoretical physicist who believes in AI. Any really successful AI engineer yeah, who believes no. in AGI. Yeah, it's like it's like I don't know any geophysicist who believes in the climate models of the IPCC. If you really understand the subject matter, you can't believe in it. Right? So this is a not dissimilar from Mises' impossibility theorem about socialism. It's the same. It's, it's the, in some sense, it's the same argument. We also mentioned this in the book when we talk about uh, examples of complex systems on which mathematical modeling fail. We cite Hayek and Mises. I think. I think David, you pointed out that we have a slight error in one of the citations. Yes, I found a few more errors in the book. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, send us the list. That's going well. well. It's, it's, it's growing all the time. Yeah. Well, you can send it every day. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to go back to this transhumanism thing. This is a topic that I've never taken any interest in. Uh, I have observed, or and this ju could just be an um, idiosyncratic response, but I have observed that when, pe when I first heard people talking about this 20 or 30 years ago, they seemed to play, place a lot of emphasis on prosthetics. Uh, whereas now, when I hear people talking about it, they they have the idea of uh, a mind without a body, um, and the or the body is a chunk of code, 
Uh, so software uh, can, can contain a mind. Uh, of course, this, it's interesting that this goes against not only Aristotle, but even Aquinas, who sort of thinkers who thought that you can't really have a soul without a body. Um, but um, uh, it seems to appeal to this idea of shedding the flesh uh, and ascending to a higher level of existence where you're just electrical impulses in a machine, <laughs> uh, which is supposed to be a great ascension. Um, and um, I, I've always thought that this, I mean, you know, I, I, the, my point of departure for coming into this is, um, well, originally it was uh, that people keep talking as though these buzzing things in, in machines are going to have will and intention and feelings and emotions uh, whereas from what I've read about the philosophy of consciousness, um, we have no idea how brains create those things. We really, uh, the, and that's not an exaggeration, we just don't know um, how brains create consciousness, how they, and much less how they create a will. Um, uh, so, uh, I, so I've thought for 20 years or so, this is a ridiculous idea. Uh, but it, it does seem to appeal to people, and it, it's sort of um, rather like a, almost like a nirvana kind of uh, uh, model of spirituality. Um, so, do you have any thoughts about that? So, Barry, you go first. So I just make a joke. It's clearly the only way to save the planet. So, we have to get along with this. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I think that that there there is this a very interesting phenomenon because very rich people are proposing this. Why are mm -hmm. these very rich people making this and supporting it so much? Because they are like the pharaohs who wanted to get the pyramids. They are striving for eternal life. And and this idea of eternal life has always been very appealing um, to human beings because, of course, the limit knowledge of one's, of one's life's limitation is tough. And so I think that that's why this ideology was developed. It, another important aspect why it arose is, of course, that there is no religion anymore among this group. If you look at these billionaires on the West Coast, they are, they are atheists. So they have nothing, um, you know, to go to with their, with their transcendent needs. So they basically create a new um, sect-like transcendent ideology. And what's so interesting is that they're using the patterns that are used in their own professional success, the, the patterns of scientific positivism, but now they kind of metaphysically enlarge them. But it, it, it doesn't work at all because, oh. because they forget about the scientific foundations of, of all of this. And it's interesting. We are witnessing basically the, the the rise of a new religion, and and it's it's really strong. So, Yuval Harari, who is a big ch uh, chap of Klaus Schwab, they are really really big fans. They really believe in this seriously. Also, Elon Musk believes in it. It's like a new pseudo religion. It will of course fail, but it's it's fascinating to see it, and it also shows you um, the lack of education of these people, right? In the end. So one interesting example is Martina Rotblat, who is the managing director, owner of the what's it, what is it called, the the car radio music station uh, system. Serious? Uh, serious. Yeah, she she founded it. it, it, it she used to be a he. She used to be called Martin. Uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that, but I just did. Um, and she's very very rich. And she, no, what you're not allowed to say is that what you're not allowed to say is that she's still a he. I see. Okay. I, so. I would like to say that she has an X and a Y chromosome. In every sense. I'm mm -hmm. not sure you're allowed to say that, but anyway. I just. <laughs> anyway, uh, she thinks that um, transgenderism demonstrates that we can free ourselves from the bonds of flesh by changing our bodies. So she be really believes that she's changed her body. She's moved into a new body. Uh, but then she says, well, if we can break the bonds of flesh in that way, maybe we can break the bonds of flesh entirely and lead a completely flesh-free existence. Um, she ha has a quite clear vision of a world in which we can have flesh 
humans and non-flesh humans, and they can procreate, create more non-flesh humans, and they can get Alzheimer's. I mean, the non-flesh humans can get Alzheimer's, and then we have medical ethics problems. How will we deal with the non-flesh humans who have Alzheimer's or who claim property rights over the, uh, the items listed in the will of the flesh humans and so forth? So it's all worked out. We're, we're, everything will be fine. And the, re the reason it will work is because all experience is just patterns anyway. So perceptual patterns, right, me right. mechanical. And so if we can put these patterns uh, in, into the cloud and keep our patterns so we are surviving. Yes. You know, as for saving the planet, you know, in the 19th century, there was this uh, sort of joke about how to overthrow the British Empire. And step one, steal a battleship. Um, so if you want to save, a, save the planet, step one is make David Ramsey Steele dictator of the world. Um, because I can do it. Uh, but I, I must say that time seems to be running out. <laughs> well, time seems to be running out is a pretty good descriptor of what we're having right here. Uh, I think that we've done about an hour's worth of uh, talking, and I've learned a lot. Uh, and I think, I hope the audience will learn a lot and maybe buy your book, Why Machines Will Never Rule the Earth. The right. world, I think it became, didn't it? Yeah, the world. Yeah. In I, an I, early I, draft, it was Earth. But oh, that's, I, yeah, that's the, okay. I sometimes still write Earth when I'm writing the title. Okay. It must okay. be somehow attractive. Very good. Level. Do you have a co cover yet? The cover? It's yeah, published. It was published last month. Oh, was it? August oh, I still have a pre-publication cup. Oh my, okay. I'm behind. Uh, you, I'm uh, way behind. That's, a, that's actually a wave seen from above reaching the shore, and it's a it's a symbol it symbolizes complex systems. Turbulent. Yes. Well, I thank you all, uh, Dr. Smith and Mr. Lankraba and uh, no, he's a doctor too. I fact, doctor he's an MD. as well. Oh, very good. He's an MD for his an MD. That's that's impressive. And uh, a real doctor, as we say in America, yeah. and, <laughs> and and David Steele, <laughs> and I'm a doctor too. Okay, I'm the only non-doctor here. Only non-doctor. <laughs> Poor me. In fact, you know, when I was when I was arguing with people about um, COVID, they would sometimes say to me, "Are you a doctor?" <laughs> and I could have <laughs> I could have said yes because actually MDs are extremely ignorant of anything to do with science. Most of them are totally innumerate. Yes. Um, yes. And, um, you know, uh, a, a, a PhD in sociology, which is what I am more likely to have at least uh, done a course in statistics and uh, read a bit about the, about the nature of science, whereas MDs, are 90% of them are totally innocent of any of that. True. So we go to a sociologist when we feel sick. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very entertaining and, and interesting to talk to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Okay, and good night. Good night. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Locofoco Netcast. My name is Timothy Verkula. I want to thank once again David Ramsey Steele and especially our two authors of the book in question, Why Machines Will Never Rule the World, Jobs Landgraba and Barry Smith. You can find this and other podcasts through your podcatcher, and at localfogo.net, which points to the SoundCloud hosting page, and as video on Rumble and YouTube. Like, subscribe, share, do all those kind things. And good night.